Hello and welcome to another Ahead of the Curve show. Today I've got my uh, guest Brandon Clements on board with me today, uh, who is a long-term friend of mine. Uh, we ended up meeting, Brandon, how many years ago? We tried to figure this out like last week and I can't even... Uh, yeah, I want to I want to say it's been at least five or six years, probably. Yeah, probably yeah. five or six years. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we've had a, a very wonderful relationship and friendship uh, during that past five or six years. And I followed Brandon quite closely over the course of that time. And uh, Brandon, I would honestly say, is uh, one of the most talented 3D artists that I know today. And uh, Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for the amazing, lovely introduction. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, so glad that you're here as well. Yeah. So, Brian, can you give us a little bit of a background of, you know, where you're from, how you started, and where are you working today? Yeah, so I am uh, located in Louisville, Kentucky. So I was born and raised in Louisville, um, actually born in Louisville and then raised in southern Indiana my whole life and um, was always interested in computers, video games, you know, all the things that were fun uh, growing up through the 90s and into the early 2000s. and decided to go to college at uh, Purdue University, um, worked at an engineering firm. Small uh, little college called Purdue, right? Teeny little college, you may, I don't know, may or may not heard of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so loved, loved my experience there uh, with everyone. Uh, met a lot of great, amazing people who are uh, really transforming the industry right now. So that's really cool to see classmates go on and do things. and. Uh, after that, I was at an engineering firm while I was in college, I should say. Um, learned a ton of stuff there. I uh, worked with um, amazing people who taught me a lot in those three years. Um, then decided to make a transition into the commercial industry and, and do something more storytelling instead of like engineering and instructional. Uh, so I started my own business uh, with Aaron Allen in 2013, I believe, of November. That's right. Yeah, because that's where I met you when you were when you uh, guys founded Glass Hand. Yes, yes. So we founded this uh, small company, Glass Hand. Uh, everyone always asks why we called it Glass Hand. Uh, and the story is I'm a huge sci-fi nerd. And <laughs> uh, you and me both, my friend. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's a common trait that runs through this industry. But uh, The Outer Limits uh, is like one of my favorite all-time TV episodic shows. And uh, my favorite uh, episode from the 60s was uh, The Demon with the Glass Hand. Uh, so that was like hugely uh, influential in, you know, kind of what my interests, where they lie. And uh, the movies that I grew up watching was like Terminator 2. James Cameron was like influenced by that episode. And uh, so, yeah, I thought it'd be cool just to kind of give it a, uh, a name instead of a distinct qualifier of like what we do. Um, and then I tried to allow the visuals to speak for themselves. And then uh, I, I taught at Purdue for a little bit too, did some adjunct. Uh, and then I am presently at the three productions uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. So yeah. I'll, I'll bring up your, your, uh, your screen here for a second. Yeah, so um, we are part of a parent organization called the Ovaria Group. Um, so we have sister companies underneath the parent. Uh, the Three Productions is a more of a media content specialist uh, company. So you come to us with an idea and we make it happen, whether it's video, interactive, um, completely virtual CG worlds, whatever it is that you need for your brand and your story, we're here for you. And then we have Scopecchio, who is the agency um, who I was a vendor for. So that relationship started from the small business working with Scopecchio, the agency. Um, and then we have Badge in Cincinnati, Ohio. They do a lot of uh, 2D design, a lot of package design. Uh, so really talented folks there. We also have Scopecchio in Orlando. Um, so you, you have oh, some- that's right. I forgot that you guys had a, an office here in O-Town. Yes, yes. So you got some uh, peeps near you. Um, I might actually be in Orlando soon. Who knows? Maybe we can meet up. <laughs> and- um, Good enough, Tom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we also have Reunion in Toronto. They do uh, brand consulting. Uh, so you go to them and they'll kind of help you figure out your brand and, and uh, how to go forward. We also have uh, ADM that's in Los Angeles and they do direct marketing. Uh, Civitas is also in, uh, I believe, Columbus. 
Ohio, and they do experiential. So um, if you have an event, they'll design the event for you. So yeah, that's pretty much wraps up that whole organization, I guess, that I'm a part of right now. <laughs> it sounds like pretty big. There's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot going on. A lot of moving parts. Uh, the idea is that Ovare Group can uh, help you depending on you know, uh, what industry you're in, what you need. Um, and then we all work as a team and uh, make it happen. So I'm super happy to be here. But I, I lead the 3D part. I guess I kind of left out what my involvement is, but I, I, <laughs> I don't. I don't really know any of those other parts quite so well. Uh, but I just need the uh, the 3D development and the uh, the renderings, the animations, stuff like that uh, on the 3D side. So, so let's talk about that a little bit, and let's kind of yeah. dive into that. So for those of you that are just uh, tuning in, uh, welcome to the show again. I've got my good friend Brandon with me today. And we're going to be diving into a lot of 3D, uh, 3D related stuff, 3D modeling, modeling software, kind of technology and where it's trending and going. Uh, as I say every week, if you guys have any comments or if you have any questions for myself or Brandon as we go through this, please feel free to interact. This is a very interactive show. We keep it pretty loose here. So uh, please, please feel free to make any comments uh, or post any questions inside of the, uh, the comment area of the stream and we will make sure to get back to you uh, either during the show or post show. So Brandon, how did you get into uh, 3D modeling? Like where, where did you, where did you begin? Where did this passion come from? Well, I, in high school, a lot of the, my friends were into like skateboarding and uh, you know, just running around. We wanted to document a lot of this stuff. So we would kind of make skate videos. We would film that. That was when I was like, at, I don't know, probably around 10 or 11, 12, like trying to figure out if we can get our parents' cameras and try to do some uh, <laughs> movie maker magic. <laughs> movie maker magic movie as you're maker. skateboarding and killing yourself and breaking your ankles. <laughs> exactly. Jumping into bushes, blue background, white text, like all movie maker magic, <laughs> uh, star wipes and, and everything. And then we would, we were actually burning those and like giving them to our friends. And, and so that was kind of the inception, I guess, of like creating something and like being proud of that and uh, having people be entertained by whatever it was that you were creating. Uh, it was almost like a little form of a escapism, if you will, for me growing up in rural Indiana. Um, so that's kind of just what we did to have fun. And then once I got into high school and like junior high, uh, I started going into like um, more computer science stuff. I was really interested in, in website development. Um, quickly found out that that wasn't my forte. <laughs> uh, so back I, dabbled, I dabbled a little bit in, uh, into that myself, you know, like yeah. back in uh, the, I would say like early 2000s when Flash was a thing. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. You know, I started getting into Flash and Action Script, and and started working in that whole realm. And I, I remember those days; they were they were frustrating. <laughs> I, I have so, many, so many great. My, my roommate literally used to code websites in um, in Notepad. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I remember there was like a Microsoft uh, front page. I think it was what it was called. Um, that's what we would use in our like little junior high classroom setting. Was you, you would open like the Microsoft Office suite and then you would start trying to build a website out of it. <laughs> uh, that was interesting, but it wasn't really where I wanted to, to be. I wanted to still make videos. It was cool that we could make websites to post the videos too. Um, but then I started getting more into, I guess, After Effects and, and more visual effects um, just because we wanted to do something grandiose in those videos, something that people haven't seen before. Yeah, or, something uh, different. I mean, that's kind of what we're all kind of running for, right? Let's try yeah. and kind of break the mold and do something outside the box. And yeah, yeah, and cool. Ex exactly, exactly. And in the friend circle, it was always like, "Oh, we learned to do this or that, or slow motion or this." You know, it, it all that stuff was really exciting to us. Um, so then I started do, entering like competitions that were like more organized. And uh, in those competitions, the funny thing is. Uh, I was looking at this the other day. I was showing one of my buddies here, as a uh, who's a coworker, and I was really in, into like shooting people on green screens and then trying to composite them in something, you know, another environment. And so I started getting into like 3ds Max, just to kind of like build these little, 
I wish I could find it so I could send it to you. It is so funny, but it's just like, it's in hindsight, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like what I'm doing today. Like, and I'm making a living doing it. But back then it was just, I had, I had no idea I could actually do that for a living. And I was just doing it because it was, uh, to me, it felt like I was creating this world and I was transporting people when they were watching stuff. But um, yeah, so I had success doing that and, and won some competitions. It gave me some more confidence and and then actually just went to college, like I said, at Purdue to, to, to do computer graphics. So yeah. <laughs> That's super fun. Yeah, I remember like my very first time getting into 3D, into the 3D world and 3D modeling, I, um, I was tasked to basically produce a 3D animated uh, piece for a corporate client. Um, and I had to build, it was basically, the concept was to have a statue uh, or a trophy, sorry, and then on the trophy was a you know a person, kind of like an Oscar kind of thing, uh, or a mannequin, and then I had to rig it and animate it to basically jump off of the, jump off the podium and then kind of run, you know, with the logo in hand of the company, and that was kind of the first task. And I had about, I want to say about two months to be able to produce it, and it was just me. Oh, so wow. I had to learn how to use 3D Studio Max. I was going like tutorial after tutorial after tutorial. Yeah. And uh, back then, you know, this is going back to about 2007, there wasn't really a whole lot of uh, assets that were available to oh, learn. No. You know, it was like a lot of books and textbooks and stuff to try and figure this out. DVD. I, I wish I still had the video. I think I might actually still have it somewhere, but. I, I, I was amazed that I was even able to pull it off myself then. It was yeah. crazy. Oh, I know. Yeah. I I remember when I was doing that and trying to figure out just what it was that I was doing, like what were these softwares kind of built off of. The only like real professional outlets uh, that I can remember utilizing was uh, Nauman Workshop. So like those were DVDs. Um, so you'd like go on their website, order them, you get them in the mail. And then... Uh, yeah, Digital Tutors was the other one. And oh, I, yeah, Digital Tutor, I I relied on to Digital Tutor very heavily. Oh, man. Yeah, that pretty much got me from, uh, you know, from zero to being able to put together a portfolio in college was just from, like, Digital Tutors. Uh, <laughs> exploring, like, exploring, hey, like, that looks like Digital stuff. Tutor. Hey, that looks like Digital Tutor. Yeah. Hey, that looks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually, uh, Kyle Green was one of the instructors um, and he did a, like a lot of the lighting and rendering stuff. And I remember the one of the first NABs I went to, they had a booth. It was, this was probably around 2015. And it was so surreal talking to him because I just knew him as like his voice and like I never saw his face. And then meeting him was just really surreal. <laughs> like, you have no idea how long I've listened to your voice and how you got me through school. <laughs> Late nights. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to ask you a few questions as well as we kind of roll through this. And I wanted to ask you about um, projects that you've worked on today and kind of find out your take on what's been the most exciting project that you've worked on and why why it was so exciting for you. If, there, if there's one that comes to mind. That's, I think that's a really amazing question. I mean, I, I feel like all the projects no matter how big or how small, they all kind of have their trappings, if you will, whether it's like budget or time. <laughs> There's always some kind of like restriction. There's always a trap. There's always a trap, no matter what, <laughs> especially when you're doing uh, 3D, because for me, I'll just want to like really take it home and make it amazing. So, uh, you know, you have to like think about your time and, and think about like how you're going to build it out, you know, storyboard it, of course. Uh, but Man, I, I'm trying to think. I think one of the best ones that I worked on, I, I think all the ones I'll mention are ones where I learned a lot. Like it was something completely new to me. Um, yeah. So the first one that I can remember was doing GE Aviation Dubai. They had a cultural center and we had to fill up that whole center with uh, media, uh, whether it was rendered graphics, uh, uh, pre-rendered graphics or real-time graphics that everyone would kind of go through and interact with. So they would change the skin for like different companies coming through, uh, different aviation companies, different investors, uh, politicians. There was like all these different, um, you know, high class people who were like going through this uh, that knew a lot about aviation. So I had to learn a lot about 
aviation and, and uh, <laughs> turbines and like all kinds of stuff, which for me was really cool because I was, you know, going to Purdue, I was super into mechanical engineering for a long time. And I always thought, you know, working at the engineering firm, that's where the path I would go. So that was kind of my two loves there. That was really cool. Um, and, I mean, man, who doesn't love airplanes? I mean, oh, I, yeah. I've, always, I've always had this passion for airplanes. I always thought when I was younger that I was going to be an airplane pilot. And I used to have the subscription for those little cards that you can get in the mail with a different kind of airplane on it and all the information on the back. And I had a huge catalog of them. And I was totally I convinced I was going to be a pilot. And now I spend more time on the planes, but in the back of it, <laughs> than in the front of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or at least I used to, along with, I'm sure, a lot of the people that are watching today. Uh, Aaron has his pilot's license. Uh, Aaron Allen, my who I mentioned previously for the viewers, those my old business partner. And like when we would fly, he would always like talk about uh, different routines or things they had to go through. And he would kind of like cue me into that. And I was like, man, you should have just been a pilot. Like, <laughs> really loved. but he had like prop planes and things that he would fly. Um, yeah. So it's like just, uh, I, I think the magical quality of it, right? Like you just, you get on and then you're in the air and then you're somewhere else on the planet. It's pretty amazing. Um, but like that region in itself, the, uh, the climate, the dust, the sand, uh, the, all of that heats up in the turbine and it eventually will like turn to glass in those turbines, which I, I had no idea about, but they talk about D rate and the, uh, the degradation of like the, the materials and stuff uh, in those turbines. And we, we had to illustrate that and like teach people about that. Um, so I was learning and teaching people so, and like, it was cool. So did you have to illustrate that uh, in, in the sense of, of modeling it and doing it as a 3d animation? Yeah, we did. Uh, we had a lot of like cutaway stuff that we would kind of explode pieces out. We talk about like this one piece in particular and why GE had solved it, or at least, you know, was better than the competition. Um, you know, we, we kind of had to do a lot of like, uh, like how to clean the engines, like when they land and stuff, there was, there was all kinds of like little nuances, little niche, uh, kind of tasks that I had no idea actually went on, you know, and, uh, it was pretty cool. It was, it was really, really, it was really interesting. It was like all stuff. It was all brand new, and I was actually using um, Octane for the first time, which was a, a GPU patch racer um, that just runs specifically on CUDA hardware. At least back then. Um, now we're starting to. Yeah, I was going to say, how how long ago was that? Uh, that was 2015. So that was yeah, so five, five years. Yeah, yeah, five years, yeah. and uh, that was a very early. Uh, Octane version, probably around 2.7 something. It was, it was a lot. You know, it, we've come a long way. It's crazy, like how robust that tool is now. Um, and now you see it for like title sequences. And so, so there's a ton of people who use it in the industry. Uh, it's very fast, which is the reason why uh, we chose it for that project and why we had to jump into it. Uh, so then we started uh, building, like. Uh, render farms basically like I was I was using render services at the time like Rebus and some of these more substantial yeah. render farms. I remember uh, using them as well that cost a fortune. Yep. <laughs> yep. So um, that was freeing in a way where we own the hardware and the software um, and allowed us to iterate very quickly show the client um, very high resolution images for some of these video walls and and, and large uh, tablet displays that they were interacting with. Um, so yeah, that project was was amazing just because of the learnings and it kind of set me on a specific path of, you know, this is what small teams can really do. And it was a very positive uh, project that I worked on. So uh, that one sticks out in my mind. Uh, I, I talk <laughs> about that one a lot to people. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty unique experience. Um, the other project that comes to mind is last, I believe, let's see, yeah, last February. It seems like from February 2019 till now is like five years, but it's only been. Oh, trust me. I was just reminiscing about vacation that we took last year and it feels like it was like five years ago. Oh, it's so crazy. Like, I, I think everyone kind of has that fatigue of just like everything that's happened politically and like, you know, the, the virus and it's just, you know, everything is, is just so strange right now. But, uh, the, the project that I did work on was in Brooklyn, New York, and it was with uh, two very talented people uh, who I look up to still today, like follow them very closely. 
uh, Elliot Mitchell, uh, he is a Unity guru. <laughs> he creates a ton of different indie games. He also works with uh, a lot of very high profile clients uh, to create interactive VR, um, trade show, museum type projects. So very location based type of projects. Uh, he's kind of a man. He's he is just super, super talented. Um, but he works on all kinds of projects. And then so a huge shout out to Elliot. Elliot, huge shout out. Yeah, thanks for putting <laughs> up with me for that whole weekend. <laughs> and then uh, Ellie Zananiri, who is uh, someone that I didn't think I'd have the opportunity of working with because I was such a big fan of his. Um, he did Zero Days VR, which I saw at SitGraph. Yeah. And uh, it's a volumetric VR film uh, that they had done with Scatter NYC. Um, and it's super, it's super amazing. Like if you have a Rift or a Vive, highly recommend it. Uh, because the story, in it, oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> the story in it is uh, amazing. It's so cool, and you're traveling like at the size of data through like computer systems. And uh, zero days is a term that's used for like cybersecurity, um, meaning yeah. that they have zero days to prepare for an attack. So um, a lot of yeah, you can call the uh, the iPhone uh, jailbreak zero day exploits. Ah, oh, there you go. Yeah. So that term is thrown around a lot, um, but uh, he is- he's Not that I wouldn't know anything about that. Me either. I have no idea about that stuff. Uh, he's basically a computer scientist. I mean, the guy is uh, brilliant um, and he's done a lot of other different projects uh, similar to Elliot in terms of experiential uh, large venues, uh, things like that. So I uh, worked with both of them. They were kind of like, the uh, uh, Ellie was more of the architecture kind of like overview of the tools. And then Elliot was writing specific tools to take all the data that we were capturing on set uh, through the Connect V2. And we were using Breckle to like tag everything and process uh, attachment data to and organize. So we had a bunch of celebrities who were coming through um, at this so old bank. Metal data ma mania. Metadata mania, uh, tons of data. It was crazy, uh, it, but you know they they had the vision and they had everything, the tools built, and I was the three D um, artist essentially. Like I would just do camera work. Um, I would work with shaders that Ellie made, um, and we would kind of create this film. So I was working very closely with the director. It almost felt like I was a video editor in some ways because the tools were so well thought out that I was kind of taking everything from the server and just creating the story with the director. So I was almost doing linear content in a uh, game engine, you know, with Unity and Timeline and Cinemachine. Uh, and yeah, that was amazing. Pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, and so we flipped that project in like 24 hours, I think it was, um, just because we had the lead time for the for the process and everything. And I think if you read the article, it was for Rag and Bone and Tom York of Radiohead. And if you read the article, it talks about like the news had written this article about the a AI was like editing the video. And that was kind of like the mystique about it. That was like the whole idea. But I was like, what? Like, no, there was like, you know, three guys. <laughs> three like, guys back behind the curtain of Oz. Yeah, yeah, who didn't sleep for like a whole day, you know, or like two days or whatever it was. Uh, yeah. So it was really cool to see the press coverage from it. And everyone was super happy and really proud of the piece. And it ha definitely has that Radiohead vibe, that Tom York Radiohead vibe. So I was so honored to actually go out there and work. And that was just from uh, relationships of people that I knew in the industry who had kind of um, teed me up for the for the position. So I was super happy to do that. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the stuff that you've been doing today, because I'd love to show uh, the people viewing some of the work and some of the stuff that you've been working on. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, this is basically our reel. I'll, I'll oh, just just, uh, I'm going to just bring it on up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is our reel uh, here at the three productions. Uh, I'll just go ahead and mute the track and, uh, or at least keep it at a low volume and just kind of talk over like what we do, what I'm, what I'm up to. So um, a lot of what we do is production. That's kind of how this started. Uh, 
believe that's actually coming through my speakers. I'm just going to mute it. <laughs> <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> yeah. yeah. So it started out, you know, this internal production group. We were shooting a lot. We were working with vendors, and uh, that's kind of uh, grown from from that place. Oh, Chet Miller. Oh, thank you. Um, so we have kind of transitioned into creating uh, visual effects in 3D, uh, kind of with the expertise that I was bringing in. Um, and, and so uh, Jacob, who is basically our art director in-house, he does a ton of the 2D animation stuff here and leads those projects. Um, and so recently we've been really collaborative, bringing like non-photorealistic rendering from 3D applications and making them feel like they're 2D, but allowing all the dynamic camera work and the shaders and the lighting, getting all that stuff for free, essentially. Um, so that's been a lot of fun, actually, jumping in and, and working with him. Uh, you can see here, there's a, just a bunch of uh, renderings for our uh, appliance client there. Uh, you could probably guess who, GE. <laughs> and, uh, and Man, it's beautiful. I mean, you could, you could almost not even tell that it was uh, rendered at all. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the I photorealism was was really well done. Uh, yeah, and and that's the the funny thing, like going to SIGGRAPH, Like, I'm always going to the talks that I don't understand. Like, I'll be honest, <laughs> I'm always I'm always like in this room with uh, all these computer scientists and uh, engineers, and they're talking about software and like the way that they talk about it so objectively. It's like they're you know they're still. Uh, energy conservation and things that we haven't fully figured out in rendering. And, and I'm like, really? There's some really great stuff out there. <laughs> it's looking really good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm that guy that just, uh, you know, uh, it's it's hard to take credit for some of this stuff because the software is so amazing. You know, the tools that we have now is, it's just amazing. But if I just kind of go back to some of these as a visual cue, um, you know, this is actually all in Unreal Engine. Um, using like hybrid rasterization and ray tracing. So, um, you know, you're getting some reflection rays and some uh, baked lighting. And yeah, I mean, it's really hard to, to, to accept, you know, praise for it because the, the tools are just so awesome right now. Um, and it's just so enjoyable to like jump in there and, and make stuff, especially with Unreal Engine. It's kind of like what you see is what you get, which is so yeah. different than where I came from using like mental ray and V-ray, although those, you know, V-ray is super fast and, you know, um, probably one of the most prolific tools used in the CG industry by so many people. Yeah, I got into, uh, again, I got into V-ray quite a long time ago and was using it, you know, when they came out with their plugin for Max. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that became my, my render engine quite quickly, actually. I V-rayed everything. Yeah. And but the learning curve on that was, pretty atrocious as well. Like it took a oh. long time of tweaking and experimenting and messing around. Oh yes, yes. Within the material editor to get things looking the way I wanted them to. Oh, oh no doubt. And and there's so many different finer controls as like global settings and things. And there are some amazing people out there who know how to tune that to get the uh, you know highest quality fast rendering out of V-Ray. Uh, but but nowadays, like throwing it into Unreal Engine and, and having 60 FPS and, you know, with hardware acceleration for ray tracing, it's it's just it's so much fun to just jump in there and work. <laughs> so, so out of curiosity, how long did it take you guys to do the piece? Uh, this one in particular, this one. Yeah. So this one is interesting because we had done a large offline rendering of this um, for like different brochures. I think it was appearing in, in some printed material um, for a product that is, uh, I don't know if I can talk about the product that's coming out. So I'll just say there, there, there is a, <laughs> so product, a product that's coming out. There is a product that's coming out that's not featured here. Um, and so this was like the vignette for that one product. And uh, it, it was kind of a slow iterative process, even, even though we have like GPU rendering and things like that. Um, there was a lot of different people who were giving us feedback. We were getting feedback from creative, uh, from the client, you know, uh, from uh, us internally. We were just kind of reacting. And so this was like a experimentation of me saying, what if I could just do all this in Unreal Engine? <laughs> and could we reach that fidelity, that level of fidelity? And so um, this one what actually, oh, thank you. Yeah, this, this one was uh, really fun, but I would say, 
our kitchen builds or interiors, I should say, because it's not just kitchens that we do. Uh, they probably take around like from the start and kick off to the finish around two weeks. Um, so we have how many, how many artists are working on it? Uh, currently, we have about four um, who will touch it, um, including myself. So I'll probably do most of the technical kind of setup, building tools. Um, so we have uh, different processes for, of course, uh, translating CAD files and and getting all of that looking really pretty. Uh, we also have like cabinet tools and things like that that we can kind of stack end to end um, to allow us to create and design any room we want. Uh, and then we also use a lot of tools inside of Blender to like help draw um, the actual walls, the roof, the baseboards. A lot of that is kind of automated. Um, so we try to work really fast um, and uh, try to be able to react to feedback at an early stage in order to get it to this point. So yeah, cool. so yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to really ask you that question because again, you know, a lot of the people that are, are, are viewing today might not have a, an understanding of the amount of time and the amount of work that it takes to even produce something even as short as, you know, like a, a pass by it could be, could be oh. three, four seconds and there could be a tremendous amount of work just put into that three to four seconds in production. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, just the, the, you know, is that the right, uh, I guess, is the, the right person's house or whatever. And we call it like the muse here. So it's kind of like this idea, uh, would someone actually live in this space? Um, so there's those kind of discussions that happen. Um, so are we hitting the right target audience in advertising uh, with this idea of a muse, if you will? Um, so there's there's tons of discussion that goes into these uh, pieces that may or may not be uh, broken down or shown in a breakdown reel or something like that. So it's really interesting to to be able to like take something from nothing, from like a blank canvas all the way to this in about two weeks with the client. So we're super proud of that of that process. So I'd love to actually hear from the viewers. If you guys are working in 3D modeling programs, which ones are you currently using? Uh, it would be it would be interesting to hear that and to actually just take an idea of how many of you are actually working in 3D environments uh, as well. So if you're working in a 3D environment or you're working with 3D tools or even uh, gaming engines, please, if you don't mind posting in the comments, it would be really cool to kind of take a tally of uh, what you guys are currently using. Uh, and as well, if you guys, again, have any questions that you want to pose to us as we're going through this, please feel free to ask and uh, we'll address them as we move on. So Brandon, let's actually dive in. I, I, I know that you had a little bit about Blender and uh, you know, Blender's been really fascinating because it's come an extraordinarily long ways over yes. the course of the last, I, I wanna say like even the last two, two to three years. Uh, and it's been unbelievably well developed, I think, uh, and moving into, in, into uh, directions to conform more within the gaming engines. Yes. And see that already in the posts, we've got Rob and Chet have both mentioned Blender right off the bat. Uh, and of course, Rob with the uh, combination of using Unity as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, the interesting thing about Blender, and it may lead us into a different conversation, you may have to steer me back, but there was a co worker here. Um, his name was Remington Markham, and he used. Uh, Blender a lot in his free time. Uh, he was hired as a 2D animator and then he was working in Blender at home and uh, posting to his YouTube channel and he just kind of like took off like with Blender and he was showing me so much within it. Uh, this is around the 2.8 period so uh, I think a lot of people will look back at 2.8, Blender 2.8 as a very big monumental release not only for them but for like the graphics industry as a whole. Like I think a lot of people really took notice uh, primarily because of all the tools that were just loaded into Blender 2.8. It was uh, overwhelming. Like, it was just like this. Uh, <laughs> it's it like they, re they reinvented the wheel. It was crazy. Like, some of the st some of the uh, the tools and the uh, add-ons that people are making for it, the whole community is just uh, incredible. And the they've always been incredible, but um, maybe not had that big of a spotlight uh, for the Blender 2.8 release because they overhauled the UI and, and everything like that. So uh, he yeah, I really downloaded it myself because I, I didn't have a whole lot of experience in using Blender um, as well. I've, I've always been pretty much a, a true and through 3D Studio Max guy. 
And yeah. you know, when you're moving from one tool to another, there's always the element of having the learning curve. And when you really know something well, it's like, well, why should I transition? Why do I want to move over from one product to another when I'm already proficient in using this one and I'm familiar with it? Yes. And you know, there's always that that big buy off where you're kind of weighing down the pros and the cons. And since Blender's come out with 2.8 and the number of people that I've seen that have started to adopt it, I'm like, okay, maybe yeah. I, this is something I should really now start paying more attention to. Yes. And uh, some of the stuff that you were posting as well in social media really got me thinking uh, about that investment because the renders that, again, that you were producing were just like stunning. Yeah, yeah, and and some of this stuff is uh, near real time, if you will. I mean, it still has to write out to disk and, and uh, save it to images or an MP4, or whatever you're making. But uh, the process of actually navigating the scene and making decisions are all real time, um, with EV. Um, even with Cycles, uh, they there's so many features that they've added to Cycles in order to uh, speed up your process as well. So. It's extremely capable, and um, if any, anyone asks, like, what tools should I learn, um, I, I think universities and, and the, uh, I guess the Gen Z, is that what they call them now? <laughs> the kids coming up, the kids coming up I, I think, are just, they're going to know Blender. They're going to know the name um, because uh, odds are one of their friends, uh, probably the person like me growing up, the nerd, is going to, like, show it to someone and they're going to be like, wow, what the heck? Like, this is crazy. Um, and the community is just so large too. The, and um, that's not just, you know, my opinion, you can go and look at the the views on YouTube, like their subscriber count. It's uh, much higher than any kind of educational channel now. It's starting to get into just uh, people who are doing it as hobbyists, you know? Um, well, the nice thing is, is it's free. Yeah. It's got a, uh, a, a an unbelievably supportive community, as we've already spoken about. And th it's also now being used in a lot of film production as well. Yeah, it is. The funny thing, one of the most uh, eye-opening encounters I've had with Blender is I was with my mom and we were going to uh, talk to her lawyer. Unfortunately, she had been in a car accident. And so there was just some legal things that we had to go straighten out uh, because she had surgery, all this stuff. So I'm with my mother and we're sitting <laughs> talking to the lawyer and he's like, what do you do for a living? And, you know, I kind of gave him my spiel and he was like, do you use blender? And I was like, what? How do you know what blender is? <laughs> <laughs> it was my mom's lawyer. And in his spare time, he makes blender animations and works freelance. And his, Oh, that's his, super funny. Yeah. His name's Sam and he's a really nice guy. And he still talks to me on Facebook and like, I'll post something like this and he'll just be like, oh, you're getting into Blender, you know? So it's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really funny because even when I was coming up through college, the stigma was you have to learn Maya. Like you, if you're gonna get a job in the industry, you're not gonna be able to jump into their pipeline unless you understand Maya uh, or whatever fundamental uh, principle, or uh, sorry, whatever task that you're interested in. So like if you're interested like me in animation and character setup, uh, they toted Maya all the way through. And once I kind of got out of the whole collegiate group, um, I started finding communities like Maxon was creating with Cinema 4D. And I think there's a lot to be said about the community of people using the tool. Because if you're using something and you're running into problems and you can't ask anyone for help, like that's a that's a big issue, right? Because we all have timelines and, and budgets and things like that for client work. And, and so if there's not a community there for support or a decent forum or, or something, YouTube videos, it's really hard to justify the cost and continue using that tool, um, especially when you see the larger communities creating these amazing pieces. So um, I, I, right now, if I had to pick my, my favorite tools, it's uh, Cinema 4D and Blender just because of the people that are involved with the software. I, I was just going to say it's funny because uh, Holly, who was on my show two days ago, you know, the mm -hmm. show that I had to postpone, uh, she was mentioning starting to learn Cinema 4D, but looking in the Blender as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, my good friend John, hey, John, um, he has been teaching himself Houdini, which. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Quite, quite the, uh, quite the, uh, the, quite the ambitious. Uh, tasked to do as well. 
I've got a good friend, uh, Ted Palace, who might also actually be watching that has been working quite heavily in Houdini for quite a number of years. And it's just incredible some yeah. of the work and the uh, the visual effects you can get out of the softwares these days. Oh, yes, definitely. Hi, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Holly. Uh, is <laughs> Jonathan, in. Jonathan's in the chat, right? Yeah. The, the, oh, nice. Yeah. Watching while rendering a, fi uh, rendering a file cache. Nice. May the simulation gods smile upon you. <laughs> <laughs> I have been there more than once. <laughs> Uh, so I, I guess uh, I'll, I'll play this little video here um, while we talk. But yeah, this is just kind of showing the, the capabilities, the fidelity of, of EV in a very simple room. Uh, these assets were actually imported from the, I think it's called Blender Kit. Uh, someone in the chat may know, but it's a plugin that allows you to post models and you can download the models. So uh, you don't even have to leave the software. Um, and this is using uh, the, incredible. what is this tool called, uh, Arc, Arc Pro, I believe. I'm so bad. There's so many like plugins and software. So many and tools, yeah. I, I can't remember all their names. Hard, um, hard to keep track of everything. Yes, yes. But it, it allows you to kind of uh, work non-destructively. So if you need to add windows, doors, trim, uh, the stuff that I had mentioned before, this has come in really handy and just... Uh, laying a room out very, very quickly, and then dumping some free assets, uh, sending it to the client and or the the creatives, and saying, "Is this even in the realm? Is this the kind of mood? Uh, you know, are, there, are these the colors? You know, things like that." You can get sign off very quickly, uh, and you can see now I'm switching over to cycles um, on the display. And the great thing about that is everything that you create in EV, uh I would say 90% of everything you create in EV is almost completely transferable into cycles. So if you want to do um, some more high fidelity path tracing, uh, you can kick that project over and, and still use cycles. Um, I believe cycles is a uh, uni path tracer. Like it only goes like one direction. It's not bi-directional. So it doesn't do things like caustics. Uh, someone in the chat may want to fact check me there, but <laughs> uh, but that's one thing that I've noticed is that some of some of the I, I guess more of the spectral quality that you would get from like Octane is, seems to be a little bit lost in cycles. But you know this stuff is under constant development. You know uh, the majority, the overwhelming majority of people probably aren't going to want to have that type of uh, fidelity uh, and or control. Um, so they present it to you in a very very understandable, nice manner. Like it's just. It's it's really amazing to to see how far this has come from like the first version of Blender that I popped open. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how things uh, come into play as we move more into real time. You know, like yeah, you can already see by the work that you've done just working inside of the timeline in Blender that mm -hmm. you're getting pretty much just about full real time results. Yes, um, out of not even hitting the full production render button. You know to yeah start rendering out your, your sequence. Yeah, yeah, and I was uh, yesterday tinkering with Mantaflow, which is their um, fluid simulation solver uh, that they just incorporated recently and uh, did a simulation, um, cached it all out. It was about 220 frames. It rendered in like 15 minutes on our on our farm, <laughs> so it's like it's just, I I never would have had that kind of speed, you know, without uh, the software engineers and like these people making these tools. It's like just in insane. Um, so it's been really fun exploring Blender, and I'm gonna continue going in down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm gonna well in all of my quote unquote spare time, which the, there has not been very much of recently. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I've been kind of tinkering around a little bit here and there and taking little bite-sized morsels. So yes. I need to need to see if I could find something, uh, to, a tutorial video, which I'm sure is kicking around somewhere. Maybe the viewers know uh, where I could find something to transition from 3D Studio Max over to Blender. You know, some of the, of course, in modeling tools, there's some there's a lot of familiarity, mm -hmm. uh, but it's always trying to find where the, those things are, you know, and how, yeah. how those different uh, applications differentiate from each other. Yeah. Uh, 
my experience of like jumping into Blender, I always wanted to go in and change the shortcuts because I was like, oh, I'll just use Blender because most of what you see is things you would see in other softwares. So I'll just change the shortcuts. That was actually a mistake because <laughs> the community <laughs> and the videos, the sure amount of videos that are out there, <laughs> if you're going to try to learn something and you want a quick tip, everyone in the Blender community is like a master at like keyboard shortcuts. And it really does speed up the way that you work. So I would highly recommend, don't be like me. If, if someone wants to jump into Blender, just learn the shortcuts because they're amazing. Yeah. Like how, how quick you can do stuff. So that's, that's my small tip, I guess, for Blender, starting out in Blender. <laughs> Take the time. <laughs> Before we wrap things up, I wanted to uh, jump into something that you've already seen, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people here have already seen, but, you know, I love video games, and uh, I don't know very many people who don't love video games, so I am just going to uh, come over here and cue this one up, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, uh, let me see if I could turn that down, but I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about what's going on with Unreal and uh, the stuff that they're doing with Unreal now. So I'm going to add this guy in. Here we go. But this is what's on the books for uh, what's coming out for PS5. And uh, from what we've seen through the demo, I'm ho hoping it holds true, it's probably going to change a lot of the way that things are done and produced today within the 3D world. So Brandon, I'd be really interested to hear some of your comments about it. Yeah, um, that when this I'm actually was- Turn it down a little bit. Yes, the epic score underneath. Or just even mute it. Yeah. Um, there we go. The, the interesting thing about this video coming out, we were in uh, at home, we were work from home uh, at this time, and I saw some news outlets that just had posted something um, about this unveilment. And so I was super curious about it. And then I just like turned on the video. This is like seven minutes after this was announced, I made a video about <laughs> it, posted it to YouTube, it ended up getting a lot of views and people were talking about it and asking my opinion. So like uh, just being at, like working from like Unreal Engine 4 and seeing like the UE3 days, like uh, the UDK days, I should say, um, till like now and the, the level of fidelity um, showing this to someone i don't know if they could like discern a pre-rendered cutscene from the real gameplay it, just because the assets look so great there's so much dynamic lighting throughout here um the new what is the new lighting engine called that they were putting into here uh, it's escaping me right now but seeing like all those screen space effects to, for doing like global illumination it's just amazing uh, but the the one thing for me that's really uh, interesting is the whole nanite technology and uh, doing some research on that. The, we, I was getting into like a rabbit hole of like mesh shaders and <laughs> you know like all these things that I that have been in development for a long time, but I just didn't pay close enough attention to. I'm sure I sat through a lot of SIGGRAPH talks about this stuff, and then it was just like a big whammy, and like the internet just kind of like blew up about this video and just couldn't believe the fidelity. Uh, that, that you're witnessing while you're playing through this game. Um, a lot to, has to be said about the actual hardware architecture here um, with the SSD that has uh, been created for that P for the PS5. Um, they actually have a... Um, Is it called a, Lumen? I think Charlie mentioned Lumen. Oh, thank you. Yes. Hey, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie Moody. That's my pal. That's my pal here. <laughs> uh, yes, Lumen. Um, Yes, so Lumen is is just an amazing dynamic lighting, uh, uh, new lighting engine that's basically going to be an, an Unreal Engine five, but the the whole nanite technology thing just keeps blowing my mind with the hardware architecture with the SSD. Um, Tim Sweeney's commented a lot about you know how Sony has created. I think they have like an FPGA that like does um, yeah uh, compressing and decompressing of textures and assets on the fly. And uh, there's there's yeah. so many layers to this that I just never knew before, and um, also was you know showcasing a lot of downfalls and a lot of inefficiencies that are in desktop computers, and how you know 
the, how desktop computers are built, like the ones that we're on right now. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see if like Intel steps up to the plate with NVMe technology and like um, how how do you like get it to the graphics card without going through the drivers and all this? There's so much to unpack there, um, but I, I just can't wait for the day where I can just dump in assets and experience them in real time. Um, and I think that I day think that is, day, awesome. is, is going to be soon, my friend. We're getting yeah. closer and closer and closer every single moment. That is for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I well, I'm hoping like what first quarter 2021 is like when they're going to start releasing um, some of this new technology to us, Epic Games maybe, I don't know. Um, but that's kind of what I was reading. So I'll be actively using Unreal Engine until that point. So <laughs> day, day <laughs> one. For a lot of other people that are watching will be as well. Yes, yes. There's still a lot of um, technology and a lot of like systems that I'm waiting to be put into place uh, with some of the virtual production explorations that we're doing here. At the three, so um, it's Christmas every day, as I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> Always something to unwrap and unbox. <laughs> so I absolutely love it. <laughs> so Brandon, I wanted to thank you for coming on board with me today. Um, yeah. For those of you watching, thanks again for tuning in. We're going to stay on, of course. We're going to go into a little more of a Q and A, uh, but and you're more than welcome, of course, to stay. Uh, but Brandon, I really, really wanted to thank you for coming on board. For those of you watching, if you want to uh, check out some more of Brandon's work and what he's what he's been working on, you can reach him at the3productions.com. Yes. Um, and also make sure to come in and tune back in next week. I've got a couple of members from uh, a local creative group called Falcon Creative Group. Uh, they do a lot of work for the theme park and theme and entertainment industry. So I've got uh, Shaheem uh, Alif, the director of technology, and uh, Jason Amber on from Falcon next week. So that's going to be fun. And it's going to be the first time I've actually had more than one person on the show at a time. So uh, it's going to be interesting kind of new format for me as well. But please tune in and check that out next week. And, uh, you know, thanks for thanks for watching. So yeah, Brennan, uh, some of the stuff that's kind of coming down the pipe and, and what, what's kind of happening in today's world you know, John Jonathan was mentioning Houdini. Have you have you done any work with Houdini, or have you guys been been working with Houdini in the studio? Yeah, definitely. Um, especially with all the tool building that I was talking about earlier, um, I, I started to hit a certain wall with some applications, just because they're not procedural by nature, um, and a lot of those workflows are kind of destructive. Um, so even in college, Houdini was um, very interesting to me. Although I felt like I didn't have a robust computer to run it, you know, I had all these preconceived notions about it. Um, but currently, we are using it here at the three. We just uh, hired a very talented uh, woman, Anna Hardy. Uh, she graduated from Purdue as well, so boiler up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's her um, software package of choice. So I can't wait to learn a lot from her, and I hope that relationship is uh, mutual you know, and beneficial to both of us just because she's learning a lot of Cinema 4D stuff and, you know, working with our animation team. And uh, I can't wait to dive into Houdini even further just to uh, create some of our own processes with like HDA assets, uh, which the, those are like Houdini digital assets. Yeah. Uh, and uh, most of the Houdini engine is packaged into other software. So you can kind of promote those variables and those tools and then bring them into Unreal Engine, Unity, uh, Cinema 4D has a great loader uh, for HDAs. Um, yeah, yeah I know uh, for us in the media server world, we're talking about being able to natively load HDAs into into media servers as well to mm -hmm. be able to uh, use those assets very similarly to the way that we manipulate and use notch blocks. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be actually really cool to see um, exploring like generative content using HDAs, that would be really, really cool. Um, something I'd actually like to witness. And, and that's actually one thing about the, the world that you live in and work in, Jeffrey, is uh, you've introduced me a lot to uh, generative content, media servers, location-based entertainment stuff. Um, so that's always something that I'm like looking at just because of you, so thank you <laughs> for yeah. sharing all the, your wealth of information about that side of the industry. I don't My know pleasure. 
I don't know if I would have found it any other way, or at least I wouldn't have had a great tour guide to lead me through the industries. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been super, it's been super fun seeing like uh, all the different tools and, and things that you're doing right now. Well, um, the fun thing is, is, you know, everything kind of crosses their paths. And when we're getting into all of these, you know, when you, you go from graphic, graphic design to motion graphics to visual effects and 3D animation and, and you know, even like stop, stop animations and mm -hmm. more traditional art and more traditional workflows. Mm -hmm. uh, it all, it all kind of comes back together. Yes. And it's, it's been really quite the journey working inside of the entertainment industry because we kind of get everything thrown at us, you know, yeah. like Holly on here, um, it's been doing a lot of stuff in after effects and, uh, she's been VJing and, and, you know, using more traditional methods for creating media, but playing it all back in a real time fashion and mixing it and compositing it on the fly. Yes. And, uh, and then we've got people like, you know, Chet that's on here as well. Good friend Chet and Jonathan who's been, or John, I've always known him as John and John Tom, uh, <laughs> but, you know, we've, uh, we've been work more accustomed to working like with beefier media and, and uh, canvases that kind of expand the normal limits yes. and, and blanket, you know, these huge different canvas types, but working with all kinds of different mediums that just kind of get tossed at us from oh, all yeah. different angles. And we're like, and, and I mean, I've, I'm still learning today about software platforms and technologies that I've never even heard of before. Right. And stuff mm -hmm. coming out of cracks. And I'm like, okay, you know, part of my job has been to really try and stay on top of technology and uh, all of these different things that people are creating and people are doing so that I can try and work out some sort of way <laughs> to be able to build that into a workflow. Right. You know? yeah. And it's, it's challenging. Yeah, it is. Uh, I also think it's like probably the most fun too, because I love talking to people and I love hearing about uh, their everyday and like the tools that they're using and learning how they are kind of like breaking their chains for like the large canvas sizes. Like if you came to me and, and we're like, hey, we're going to do this thing. It's going to have this massive canvas size. I'm going to like just, you know, be at a loss for a minute, moment. It's going to, you know, be really shocking. But most people, you know, that deal with it, that's just normal, you know? And so that's just how they carry on and create their content. Um, so it's really fascinating to talk to people from different facets within the industry. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's kind of the, one of the reasoning, reasoning that I've had about uh, trying to keep the show fairly diverse and cover a whole bunch of different mediums and topics and, and uh, technologies and stuff like that and bringing on people from all kinds of different sorts of areas within the industry yes. to talk about you know, their focus and their use of technologies, which uh, I think is going to be really interesting again next week because it's coming in, in at it in storytelling in using technology, but within the theme parks and within the theme themed environments, you know, oh, so it's yeah. a completely different take on the way that you do things for film or commercials or, or live events or anything else, you know, oh, and yeah. the workflows are just, they have a lot of similarities, but they're still quite different in the way that they work. Exactly. Exactly. That's really cool. Can't wait to tune in next week. <laughs> <laughs> I can't either. I'll be on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming on our time. I just wanted to thank you guys. Uh, thank you again. I want to thank the viewers for all of your support every week. This has been uh, a lot of fun. been having a really good time doing these shows and, and bringing these people on for you. Um, if you guys also have any anybody that you would like to see on the show within reason, of course, uh, or any topics you'd like to see covered, please let me know again, leave, leave them in the comments. Um, and, or, you know, people you think would be cool to have, just have on the show and, and chat. So always looking for good people to talk with, uh, always looking for some, you know, some fun content, but, uh, just wanted to thank you guys for, for joining us on this journey. Please tune in again next week, uh, to check out Falcons creative group, Brandon. Thank you so, so much thank you. for being on the show. If you guys want to uh, check out more of Brandon's work, please check out the three productions. And as I say every week, stay ahead of the curve, everybody.